I think people are waking up to the importance of a digital, more portable version of gold because so much of commerce is moving online. What gets really interesting is if you start to think about Bitcoin and its all-time highs, not versus the dollar, but versus other regional fiat currencies. It's a currency, it's a store of value, it's programmable money, it's, you know, it, it's got like the bill of a duck and the tail of a beaver and, you know, it, it doesn't fit into any nice, neat little bucket. Hello, YouTube. Welcome to the show. My name is Jackson, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming Ryan Selkis, who is the CEO and co-founder of Masari. How are you doing today, Ryan? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's really great to have you on. I've actually been really interested in speaking with you. So I guess we'll start things off on more of a fun note. There's been a lot of commotion on Twitter recently because J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, recently became aware of Bitcoin and is now feeling the full force of the crypto community. Um, I saw that you mentioned the whole event in one of your recent tweets, and I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on your thoughts and feelings of this whole event. Uh, to be honest, I haven't thought twice about it <laughs> other other than to remark on how ridiculous the whole thing was uh, in in terms of, you know, frankly, caring what uh, J.K. Rowling has to say about magic Internet money. Uh, I think, you know, uh, it's just like anyone else, any other celebrity, there's an opportunity to educate, get them excited and um, and and maybe just get them curious. Right. Or, or, or make a, a good positive first impression. And um, and, you know, as you can imagine, there is no PR person for Bitcoin and the community is uh, rather interesting and has been for a long time part of the DNA. So uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that all of the hilarity that ensued with that particular Twitter thread and, and everybody piling in. But, um, you know, who knows, maybe she and, and Elon will, will finally come over the hump at some point in the next year, given everything that's happened in the macro context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would be amazing. And interesting is definitely a good way to put it. So as you know, and as everyone knows, the Bitcoin halving proceeded last week smoothly without any hiccups. And I'm really looking forward to reading uh, Masari's post halving analysis and report. And I was wondering if you could give me a little prelude to that report and tell me how you guys approached researching the having and what insights did you discover? Well, you know, I, I think I'm on record as saying that this is probably the most important as a um, as a narrative hardener, uh, right? So the at a time where central banks are printing unparalleled, you know, dollars and, and, and fiat assets uh, to recover from the coronavirus, you just happen to have the most important deflationary event in Bitcoin's life cycle so far, which is the symbolic threshold that it's crossed from, you know, three and a half percent down to down to sub two percent, which you know is the Fed's target inflation rate for the economy. Um, and I think that's uh, you know it, it couldn't come at a possibly better time because you've started to see institutional investors look around at alternatives, and you've got gold, which is this traditional safe haven asset, and then this up and comer, which. Uh, should potentially rival gold as a speculative store of value, or at least be a, 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 a digital complement, um, and as the added benefit of, of, of pretty pronounced uh, portability improvements over gold. And this is something that uh, has finally kind of caught mainstream awareness. And by mainstream, I mean, you know, one major institutional investor in Paul Tudor Jones, which in, you know, institutional investing circles is massive because it's follow the leader. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, it's generally been a straight shot up for 10, 11 years. Um, but the, the biggest opportunity, you know, going forward is, is just to reinforce this uh, digital scarcity elements that Bitcoin created for the first time ever, and, and, and which was really the, the novel solution and, and not just money, but how do you create digital scarcity, period, um, provable digital scarcity. So I, I think that's important. Um, you know, there's been uh, there's been a ton of work that our team has done in, in putting different models in context, like stock to flow, and you know, studying the the difference between gold and Bitcoin uh, inflation rates, and and you know, looking at the potential you know, quote unquote mining death spiral that um, that you know we think is more more myth than anything else. Um, there's uh, you know, there's there's quite a bit of good work out there um, on the having as um, in terms of 
actual quantitative deltas that you see in, in network security or, or you know, other key uh, network stats. But far and away, the most important thing is the narrative element of it all. Yeah. And the thing about the Bitcoin having is that it's a primarily a mining event. You know, it, fundamentally, it doesn't have any immediate impact on the price. And it's mostly just an event uh, for the miners. So I was wondering if you could explain a bit more why you believe that this mining death spiral is just a myth. Well, because the the mining capacity that tends to fall off after these having events is it's the weak hands and it's the you know most uh, it's the miners that have the highest cost basis. But with the price where it is, those that have the most advanced equipment are still profitable, right? You know they're they're still you know making margin, and as some of the less profitable capacity falls offline, you'll see a natural difficulty adjustment. We saw this in two thousand sixteen. Um, we're seeing it again now. But the march forward in terms of new ASIC chips and, and higher efficiency uh, mining operations, you know, continues to march inexorably onward. So, um, you know, it would probably take the combination of a major liquidity event like we saw on Black Thursday and the halving um, to really put the hurt on miners, which is not totally out of the question. But we've never seen a situation where things got that dire that um, that the, the network just ground to a halt. And by the way, most of the miners, the, the institutional miners that are responsible for the majority of network security, they have hedges in place if there is an event that um, that looks and feels you know, exactly like that. It is very unlikely that they would do the equivalent of bricking all of their own you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment, um, even in the worst doomsday scenario where they had to to mine unprofitably for a short period of time because they wouldn't want uh, trust to be diminished in the network and, and for blocks to take you know an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever it is, um, and cause this you know, short-term dislocation and, and, and a difficulty. Um, so you know, again, I, I think it's, it's overblown. It's been one of those things that's been de-risked over time. And to me, the more interesting element is um, what happens in subsequent halving cycles and, and will we see changes in um, the composition of the minor award to skew more towards higher fees as the issuance continues to tick lower. What, what exactly is that lower bound for network security? Great. So now I'd like to turn our eye more towards the macro and global scale. Um, there's a lot going on in the world right now. You've got COVID-19, you've got universal money printing, massive job loss, and the stock market is rising amidst all of this. And I think it can be really difficult and overwhelming to really understand what's going on holistically uh, and putting everything into a larger perspective. So I was wondering if you could kind of break down your view of what uh, on the macro scale of what's going on in the global economy right now and where crypto fits into all of this. Well, you know, I think I hinted at it with the news from uh, Paul Tudor Jones you are starting to see a mainstreaming of the digital gold narrative. And given uh, everything that's going on with the coronavirus, uh, I think people are waking up to the importance of a digital, more portable version of gold because so much of commerce is moving online. So much of your life is moving online. Um, and especially in, in kind of a, a global lockdown, you know, there, is, there is no flight. Uh, there's no physical flight to safety and, and people emigrating from hostile regimes or, um, you know, things that, um, that, you know, traditionally, you know, you'd want to wear the gold that you had around your neck, um, in that kind of doomsday scenario, um, with this, you're, you're hiding inside, right? So, so the, the escape and the exit is virtual. Well, gold doesn't do you a whole heck of a lot of good in, in, in that scenario. But, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, more generally speaking, you know, investors, uh, you know, the big the big investors are diversifiers by nature, right? So why put all of your eggs in in, in one treasury bill basket, given everything that's going on in the U.S.? Why put all your bag, all your eggs in one basket with gold, particularly given how it did from 2012 to you know current, when you know people forget it lost a ton of its value after the sovereign debt crisis abated. Um, so I, I, I generally think that maybe the most interesting development in this particular cycle is the fact that Bitcoin has finally um, ascended to that stage and, and that level of importance um, globally. 
So I'm I'm curious because there's this idea that I've heard, you know, there's a lot of money printing going on and people are expecting uh, inflation and the devaluing of the U.S. dollar and other currencies. And we're certainly seeing that, you know, there's the inflation is widespread. It's not just in the U.S. It's happening in other countries around the world. There's even hyperinflation in other countries around the world. And the idea is that because inflation is happening everywhere, the U.S. dollar will actually retain or could even come out better in its valuation because compared to other international currencies, it will do much better. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this idea of the U.S. remaining better relative to other international currencies and how that relationship between the dollar and other currencies will affect Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, one of the more interesting things from our uh, reports uh, that's coming out tomorrow is, is kind of the follow up is, uh, you know, taking a dollar centric view misses some of the larger picture. Um, the same thing happened in 2011, 2012, right? There was a flight to safety in the U.S. dollar, even though one of the uh, catalysts for the sovereign you know, debt crisis was the U.S. debt downgraded by, by S&P. And what happened? Well, treasuries rallied and they went to their lowest yields in, in years. And, and ultimately, the dollar was just fine because people counterintuitively um, flocked to it as, as you know, flight, flight to safety. Um, the big issue with a strong dollar is going to be felt in emerging market debt. And what gets really interesting is if you start to think about Bitcoin and its all time highs, not versus the dollar, but versus other regional fiat currencies. So, for instance, we just saw a new all time high for Bitcoin versus the Argentinian peso. We're very close to all time highs for the Brazilian real, the South African rand, Turkish lira. Um, and I'd expect that we probably hit some of those all time highs sooner than you know, US dollar all time high. You're kind of revisiting the 20,000 mark that everybody talks about. So if you zoom out and you think about Bitcoin as a potential store of value, even if it is volatile relative to some of these other emerging market fiat currencies that do have high inflation that aren't benefiting from the reserve currency status the US dollar does, then it starts to look you know, quite a bit different. Yeah. So you've really been hammering on this Bitcoin as digital gold store of value narrative. Have you totally counted out the Bitcoin as a currency narrative? Uh, well, I, I, I like uh, Spencer uh, Bogard from, from Blockchain Capital, his, his old uh, comparison of Bitcoin to the platypus, right? It's a currency, it's a store of value, it's programmable money, it's, you know, it, it's got like the bill of a duck and the tail of a beaver and, you know, it, it doesn't fit into any nice, neat little bucket. Um, traditionally, currencies have been relatively stable because they've been fixed supply and fixed population. What's interesting about Bitcoin is you've got an exploding population of people using it and treating it different ways for different use cases. And that results in you know, quite a bit of, of you know, dislocations in, in terms of how it's priced because it's fixed and it doesn't match dollar to dollar with the population that's using it. So uh, I do think long term, as, as more people acquire it, as, as it starts to um, look and feel more similar to gold, that will stabilize. But, but you know, by definition, that can only happen if it hits trillions and trillions of, of market caps. So it's this weird dynamic. And um, I would say that if you look at the shortest amount of time, it's an excellent currency because it can move faster than anything else anywhere in the world, right? Um, Fast as you know your 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 internet connection versus T plus two or, or or whatever the settlement would be in your in your banking system. If you zoom out, it becomes an excellent currency because it's hard uh, and it's commodity money like gold. Everything in between, it's a tradable uh, speculative asset, right? And and it's a trader's paradise. So it really depends on your time horizon. If it's instant or long term, it's a it is a good currency. Uh, anything in between, right? If you got to pay bills and in, in fiat, then you you probably want to make sure that you have uh, fiat revenue or fiat savings versus uh, living and dying by the, you know, spe the the volatile whims of where the Bitcoin price is. I thought one of the issues with Bitcoin becoming a currency was the fact that it wasn't that fast. You know, it takes 10 minutes to confirm a block. And if you're sending a large amount of money, it can have even more confirmations required, which can make it, you know, take even longer, uh, up to an hour or more. And I thought this issue with the speed of confirmations and transactions 
was one of the reasons why Bitcoin started veering more towards the digital gold narrative and away from the uh, international global payment system narrative. Well, I, I think there, you know, there are solutions around that, right? Lightning is still very, very early for small payments, but for large payments, you know, it, it's still by far the fastest uh, method that you can you can actually settle any type of payment. Um, and and you know, let's not conflate the uh, the time to send and the time to confirm, right? You can research, you can receive assets instantly. How long you want to wait? Uh, and how many confirmations you would like to wait uh, to ensure that that hasn't been double spent is entirely your prerogative. But there's there's nothing that prevents you um, from instantly you know receiving and, and sending you know payments. The cost and the hassle of of executing a double spend for a five dollar coffee transaction is just not worth it, right? Uh, for 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 you know by and large for most use cases. So you're going to be comfortable taking that risk. That the person on the other end of the transaction is going insanely out of their way to defraud you of five dollars. You know, if it's five hundred thousand dollars, you're probably going to be comfortable waiting an hour, and that's still a hell of a lot faster than anything else um, that we that we have today in, in payments. Um, whether you're talking about uh, you know central bank driven and kind of traditional banking driven, or even fintech driven. So now I'd like to switch focus to something that actually happened the day after the Bitcoin halving on May 12th. Pavel Durov, who is the CEO of Telegram, announced that Telegram was terminating its association with the Telegram Open Network and would no longer be developing the Gram cryptocurrency token. This came after a lengthy legal battle with the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. And this is now the second time that we've seen a potential cryptocurrency titan, the other one being Libra, have major setbacks and in this case fail because of U.S. regulatory policy. So I'm curious to hear what your thoughts on the potential role that one of these uh, really big corporate cryptos could play in the macroeconomic structure. And what are your thoughts and feelings on the U.S.'s regulatory approach to these entities? Well, I mean, the U.S. doesn't want to lose control over its ability to print money, right? Um, I think uh, Libra will ultimately launch. It's going to be a permission system. It's it's basically going to be uh, a hybrid between a cryptocurrency and a central bank digital currency. Um, it's not permissionless, right? They came out of the gate saying that um, it's going to be single um, uh, single currency pegged to the U.S. dollar. So it doesn't look anything like the desired cryptocurrency and and kind of true uh, international reserve that that they were working on. But a company like Facebook spearheading that was probably too much to ask for, you know, right out of the gates anyway. Um, there are going to be other stablecoin initiatives, and there are other stablecoin initiatives that are taking, you know, different uh, paths. Uh, Celo being one. Uh, obviously, you've got the more regulated versions like USDC and Paxos. On the other hand, um, you do have uh, algorithmically generated uh, reserve asset or, or uh, crypto dollars that are being created through things like Dai. Um, you've got the kind of frontier, uh, I don't want to call it dark web, but um, but kind of original cowboy, uh, you know, crypto dollar, which is Tether, uh, still the largest by an order of magnitude. So um, I think the 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 it, it's kind of like crypto, more generally speaking, right? The U.S. government can shut down individual projects because they're just in the crosshairs of, of this administration, where. They're they're deemed to be too centralized, and and it's easier to to go to court with Telegram or Facebook because they're large companies. It becomes exponentially more difficult to do that at scale with dozens of different implementations that are all taking slightly different design uh, paths. And especially once these things do actually become decentralized, uh, it it is very very difficult to put the genie back in the bottle. So I, I do think you'll see some stablecoin, probably algorithmically generated stablecoin projects. That ultimately um, are issued and, and generated more like Bitcoin, where there is no off switch, and um, you know how long that takes you know remains to be seen. But I think um, you know we're, we're kind of in the first inning when it comes to stable coins, and still you know second inning maybe in in Bitcoin and crypto more generally. 
So I'd like to actually go back to someone that you mentioned near the beginning, uh, Paul Tudor Jones. And this news was really big, all in crypto recently. And there's always been talk about the implications and timing of big institutional investors getting involved in crypto. So I'm curious to hear um, you talk a little bit more about your thoughts on institutional investment in crypto. And, you know, do you think that this is the beginning of a waterfall, a big wave of institutional investors getting involved? Or do you think that these investors are already here in crypto and it's just becoming more apparent as they start to reveal themselves? I think it's probably a little bit of both. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's almost certain that this is going to have a positive impact on any institutional investors that might have been getting knowledgeable about Bitcoin, but didn't necessarily pull the trigger. And um, and you know you need someone like that to kind of come out and 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 take all the arrows and get all the press and make it safe um, for for you to actually you know get off zero and, and start to put you know some some assets to work. And then you know you think about what what you know folks like Fidelity are doing. All the infrastructure now is in place, right? So, so part one was getting, you know, the unwashed masses excited about Bitcoin. That happened, you know, in 2009 to 2017. But then the money started to get real and everything that was built in the couple of years since then on the in institutional infrastructure side uh, is going to pave the way for the Paul Tudor Joneses of the world to make their first purchase. And ultimately, everybody else kind of follows the leader. So I, I definitely believe in that path uh, just from like a, an adoption standpoint and from an enterprise embrace standpoint. But that only happens with some of the, the macroeconomic backdrops that we have, you know, even pre-coronavirus, um, you know, record debts, uh, you know, consistent money printing, dysfunctional governments, um, all that was already in place. This has just been a, a massive accelerant of a lot of the trends that have been going on for 10 years. So for my last question, I think a lot of people recently have been uh, bamboozled more or less by the stock market. You know, you have this, our, our economies are failing. There's massive unemployment. Everything is forced to change and companies are really struggling and figuring out how to react. And yet the stock market is going up. So how do you make sense of this relationship between a failing economy and a rising stock market? Well, the, the stock market is forward looking, right? So there, you could argue that there's too much optimism in the market or, or, or not enough. It you know, depends on how much we're printing and what your inflation expectations are and expectations around uh, kind of future growth. But with interest rates where they are, the impact of short term hits to the economy are radically uh, reduced in terms of how they're reflected in, in, in a different you know, company's asset prices. Um, that's just kind of like basic discounted cash flow and, and you know, kind of uh, future value projections. But um, I think the, the, the crisis to watch out for is, is always going to be kind of liquidity and insolvency crises, where like, are there permanent dislocations in certain markets? Are there companies that don't get bailed out or, or that just become structurally deficient and, and ultimately fall by the wayside because this uh, health crisis lasts a year or two, right? Airlines being one, the restaurant industry and kind of small businesses being another. And um, that, I think, has a, you know, an incredible deflationary impact on the economy. Um, it's net very unhealthy um, for kind of Main Street and, and ultimately for kind of downstream spending. But um, at the same time, you know, a very large chunk of the stock market indices are tech companies these days. So those are the ones that tend to be weathering the storm the best. And, and in some cases like Amazon, you know, you've seen a, a 10 percentage point increase in, in, in e-commerce um, over the course of the last uh, you know, few months, really. Well, that means uh, Amazon is going to be a net winner there, right? Or digital content consumption. Netflix is going to be a net winner there. So I don't, um, I don't read too much into the you know, stock market in, in any given day, but I, I personally um, would protect against you know liquidity, uh, flights to liquidity and, and kind of panics like we saw in March, which is why you know I think you know safest place to be is in cash. But for people that are investing, you know you're going to want to have some hedged exposure um, for for some of these potential crashes or, or think about what your game plan is if, if things really go sideways again. 
Thank you so much for coming on the show. That was Ryan Selkis, the CEO and co-founder of Masari. My name is Jackson, and if you enjoyed the show, please hit that like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.